have enough coffee. So I just want to, uh, before we get started here, I have a couple reminders. One is, um, if you haven't taken time with your team here to um, go over your resource sharing exercise and get that ready to turn into your facilitator, please do that. Um, and the second thing is just a reminder to put ideas up on our where do we want to be board, which is in the back corner of the room. And by the way, it is filling up, so get your ideas up there. Um, so far this week, we've been taking a wide angle look at the changing demographics of our country and examining models for inclusion, um, both from outside the field and looking inward um, to our own assumptions and biases. But we're going to shift now and talk about the financial state of our field. Um, meanwhile, we will be keeping the diversity frame present um, because you'll see that when it comes to revenue streams and points of community engagement, diversity is just as essential for financial health, especially in challenging times. So last year, Teresa and I shared important highlights from TCG's Theater Facts 2010, our annual field report based on the fiscal survey. And due to the overwhelming clamor for more of the Teresa and Kevin show, <laughs> we're back to do it again. And I'm happy to say we have some cautiously good news. First, we want to thank the 179 theaters that completed the fiscal survey this year. Um, Theater Facts 2011 is a report available to everyone, but only the theaters that participate in the fiscal survey have direct access to all of the data and the ability to generate customized reports. It's really been a helpful tool for me over the years, and we want to thank all of you here today who participated in the fiscal survey. We know it takes a wee bit of time but the quality of this research is only possible because you take the time, so thank you. Last year we made a similar plea and we saw an increase in participation. So this year, do we dare shoot for 200 participating theaters? I think we dare. <laughs> <laughs> I think... I think, we, <laughs> I think we do too. So if you're a theater that hasn't participated in the fiscal survey, please make time to do so. And if you need any assistance filling it out, Chris Schuff, who's our director of management programs. Chris, where are you? Raise your hand. Um, and Alana Rose. Alana, are you here? Alana Rose here. Um, they are willing to help you out. And, they, and also, if you're a theater that's taken the survey and find it useful, please spread the word and get your colleagues to participate. And the word of Theater Facts 2011 might very well be... However tentative, cautious, and conditional... Recovery. The possibility of recovery. So let's begin with the universe. <laughs> Theater Facts 2011 includes the universe, which is 1,876 not-for-profit theaters, the profiled theaters, which is the 179 theaters that participated in the 2011 survey, the trend theaters, which are 113 theaters that completed the fiscal survey in each of the past five years. We also have Taking Your Fiscal Pause 2012, which is 206 theaters that responded this fall to a 10-minute snapshot survey of their current fiscal health. So theater facts is a whole lot of data. So today we're going to focus on those 113 trend theaters that completed the survey in each of the past five years. We'll look at those five-year trends as well as one-year trends from 2011 and sometimes reference that 2012 snapshot survey to get a sense of the current picture. But before we take that closer look, let's take a moment to recognize the scope of our theater universe. In 2011, theaters provided 14,600 productions with 177,000 individual performances for 34 million audience members, which by the way is up from 31 million in 2010. Yes. Theaters also employed more people in 2011, 78,500 artists, 36,000 production and technical workers, and 15,500 administrators, contributing nearly 1.94 billion to the U.S. economy. Yes. Now, while we must note that the universe is not the exact same set of theaters year to year, our trend theaters, those member theaters that have responded to the fiscal survey each year since 2007, also reveal a rise in overall attendance of 2.5% from 2010 to 2011. 
Unfortunately, those trend theaters show a 4% overall decline since 2007. However, the bump in attendance this past year could be a sign that the tentative economic recovery is beginning to bear fruit. The 2012 snapshot survey supports that possibility with nearly three quarters of respondents reporting similar or higher than expected overall paid attendance. There's also fruit to be found in the branches of CUNA the change in unrestricted net assets. In 2011, 58% of the trend theaters reported a positive CUNA, the second straight year well over 50%, bouncing back from a five-year low of 40% in 2009. There are a number of trends driving this po positive shift in CUNA. Let's start with ticket sales. First, the bad news. The past five years have seen decreases of 1% in total number of single tickets sold, 16% in the average number of subscription tickets sold, and 4% in overall attendance. However, in 2011, those downward trends started pointing in the right direction, with the number of subscription tickets sold holding steady, a 5% increase from 2010 in total number of single tickets sold, and a 2.5% rise in overall attendance. 2011 also saw a rise in ticket income, with single ticket income leading the way, rising 7% in the past year and 13% over the past five. This increase is linked to a rise in single ticket prices of 5% in the last year and 7% over the past five. The 2012 snapshot survey also saw nearly three quarters of respondents reporting ticket income equal to or greater than expected. Last year, we shared with you the rise in dynamic pricing, which for many theaters has become standard practice. While many theaters found success with dynamic pricing, particularly with a hit show, others voiced concern about accessibility and inclusion. When we reported last year that ticket prices were up, but attendance was down, a forum attendee remarked, well, that sounds like a recipe for extinction. <laughs> However, this year, with both attendance and ticket income on the rise, a more nuanced picture may be emerging, with some theaters noting that dynamic pricing allows them to be more inclusive by keeping ticket prices accessible for off-peak performances. But the real surprise is that the report of the death of subscriptions may have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> While the average number of individual subscribers did fall 17% over the past five years, subscriptions were at their highest rate of renewal in the past five years in 2011 at 75%. The one-year change shows subscription income, tickets, and the number of subscribers holding steady or falling only slightly. While there is an undeniable long-term downward trend, subscriptions still remain the second highest income generator for theaters, and many theaters are reporting renewed interest in subscription. Theaters are also reporting an increasing interest in process, with attendance at staged readings and workshops rising 16% in the past year and 81% over the past five. Though these events make up a smaller percentage of overall attendance, the question still arises, what could be driving this rapid increase? Now it's time for a quick TCG infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> the hunger for deeper audience engagement will take center stage at our audience revolution convening in February 2013 in Philadelphia. You should have already received an invite to participate in this convening, and you'll soon be emailed a survey regarding your, your own audience engagement practices. Please respond to this survey and help us build on the rising interest in audience and community engagement. Now, back to our original <laughs> program. <laughs> <laughs> While the attendance numbers are encouraging, they alone cannot explain the 8% explain the increase in earned income in the last year. Over the past five years, the field saw a 39% increase in booked-in event income and a 46% increase in rental income. And never underestimate the power of a well-stocked bar. Con <laughs> concession income jumped 18% from 2010 to 2011 and 15% since 2007. Theaters are also working together more, perhaps inspired by meetings that occur at those well-stocked bars. <laughs> Five-year growth in co-production and enhancement fund income surpassed inflation by 25% and reached its highest level in 2011. The two-year trend of positive CUNA is also driven by something outside the theater, the stock market's ongoing, if uncertain, recovery. 
Average capital gains from investment assets rebounded 163% from 2010 to reach their five-year peak in 2011. This was especially important since endowment earnings and transfers fell 14% from 2010 and 39% from 2007's peak. Still, both capital gains and endowment earnings have made major recoveries from those dark days of 2008 and 9. And while we can't pretend we're out of the woods, we must also entertain the possibility that our direction has shifted. A year ago, we stood here and spoke of glimmers of hope in an age of austerity. Those glimmers have grown, and not just on the earned income front. A year ago, I stood here and read a grim list of declining contributed income <laughs> across the board. Individual, trustee, corporate, federal, city, county, and foundation all declined in 2010. But 2011? Contributed income increased by 26% in 2011 and by 14% over the past five years. The greatest support came from individual and trustee contributions, which increased, all right, yeah, give it up. <laughs> Sorry. Which increased 55% from 2010 and 30% over five years. Now this is important. Trustees really stepped up in 2011 with the average trustee gift climbing from a low of $11,000 in 2010 to a high of $17,100 in 2011. Total trustee <laughs> donations jumped from $38 million in 2010 to a five-year high of $52 million in 2011. <laughs> Since we're in a room with so many trustees, I would really like to take a moment to applaud that essential support and leadership. Again, again, again. <laughs> Non-trustee individual donations also increased, driven perhaps by a rise in capital campaign contributions. We'll come back to that. Giving reached a five-year high average gift of $530, though fewer individual donors contributed. Just a reminder real quick that when you participate in the fiscal survey, you can actually benchmark your own financials against whatever specific data sets that you want. Here endeth the plug. <laughs> The rise in trustee and individual giving may be linked to the rise in fundraising event income. While these events are certainly a lot of work, their increase may support the idea that audiences and donors are hungry for deeper engagement and more high-touch events, as we saw with the rise in stage readings and engagement events. Foundations also bounced back in 2011 and remain the second biggest source of contributed income, increasing 22% in the past year, though it's still down 7% over the past five. Corporate support increased 22% in the past year, though we're still down 20% from 2007. This rise in contributed income from all sources may continue in 2012, with a majority of snapshot survey respondents reporting increased contributed income across the board. It's also worth noting that while in-kind donations from individuals, corporations, and sheltering organizations showed a small one-year decline in 2011, over the past five, they grew by 25%. As with the rise in co-productions, theaters are finding sustainability in partnerships. With this positive but conditional growth in both earned and contributed sources, total income increased 16% in the past year and 3% over the past five. This is a different tune than last year where we saw total income growth falling short of inflation. However, you may have heard two troubling words making a comeback in the news lately, fiscal cliff. <laughs> this combination of expiring tax cuts and automatic spending cuts will surely affect theaters. What's more, both the charitable deduction and the IRA charitable rollover are at immediate risk. The Senate is including legislation called the Peace Limitation, which would place limits on all itemized deductions, including charitable deductions. While some have called the provision a haircut, others believe it may reduce tax deductions by as much as 20% of their total value. Also at risk are the funding levels for the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arts and Education Program at the U.S. Department of Education. As our Congress attempts to avoid pulling a Thelma and Louise, now is the time to remind them of the intrinsic and economic value of the arts in fostering vibrant communities. We encourage you to write a letter congratulating your new and returning members of Congress that testifies to the importance of theater in your community. We can make a difference in Washington, but we need active participation in arts advocacy from everyone in the field. Thankfully, the size of our field is growing. 
The increase in income supported 8% more of expenses in 2011 from 2010, which leads us to particularly happy news. Theaters added 10% more employees to their payroll in the past year, reaching a five-year high in 2011. After a painful round of belt tightening in 2009 and 2010, there were increases in all but one expense category, physical production, in 2011. The 2012 snapshot survey implies these increases may continue, with a majority of respondents planning to increase their budgets in the next fiscal year. Now, after hearing all of this good news, qualified conditional good news, <laughs> you might be wondering, when do I get to feel that good news? Well, it's hard to feel that good news when you're struggling to meet day-to-day -day operational costs. Though 2011 saw some improvement, theaters continue to face challenges with working capital. Theaters have experienced negative working capital since 2007, and those numbers nosedived in 2009 and 10, more than doubling the aggregate negative working capital. Let's look at it another way. The working capital ratio is the proportion of unrestricted resources available to meet operating expenses. Theater Facts Financial Consulting Service, Cool Spring Analytics, recommends a working capital ratio benchmark of 25%, or three months of your budgeted expenses in available cash. What was the average, what was the average ratio in 2011? While cash flow for day-to-day -day operations took a major hit in the past five years, it is at least now flowing in the right direction, up 11% from the five-year low of last year. And if you are a theater struggling with working capital, you're not alone. In the past five years, there have never been more than 12 theaters who met that benchmark of 25%. In the 2012 snapshot survey, 40% of theaters reported having cash flow issues. Positive working capital not only helps with that day-to-day -day cash flow, but can also help theaters invest in the future through ideas, infrastructure, and innovation. And, through the working capital, and though the working capital numbers remain daunting, they also reveal a significant investment in infrastructure. A sustained growth in capital campaigns has led to new and improved facilities, as well as 27% rise in fixed assets over the past five years. 36% of trend theaters were involved in some kind of capital campaign in 2011, a five-year high. So what can we take away from all this research? We know that these positive trends have not erased the losses of the past five years. Here on the East Coast, we're dealing with our own recovery from the devastation of Hurricane Sandy, and we know many theaters across our country feel a long way from all right. We also know that those boom times may have been inherently unstable, and 2007 isn't a place we'd want to return to, even if we could. However, these takeaways are more than just silver linings. Two straight years of positive CUNA for more than half of our theaters. A one-year rise in attendance and ticket income. Theaters diversifying and strengthening their earned income revenue streams. Rebounding contributed income streams across the board. Working capital remains a major concern, but it is moving in the right direction. Our field may not be recovered, but at the very least, this looks like an opportunity for recovery if we can seize it together. Our task now is to build on the momentum, and as we strengthen the fiscal health of our organizations, remember that diversity in revenue streams, both earned and contributed, is essential not only to the challenging times, but as we move from sustaining to thriving. The rapid rise in engagement events suggests that a diversity in our points of community contact may also, also be increasingly essential, a theme we'll explore next February in our audience revolution convening in Philadelphia. Uh, as we now return to considering diversity in the context of our human resources, it's useful to remember that these principles are rooted in our fiscal and programmatic health as well. Now what we want to do at this point is something that we haven't really done before, but we'd really like to um, either field questions for ourselves from you guys or, or have you guys ask each other questions about something you may be facing at your theater that you might want some advice on. This is just going to be... Karen Jensen, our moderator, Executive Director of Alliance of Thank you, thank you, thank you. Kwame Water. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Water. Uh, Kwame Kwearma, Artistic Director, Center Stage. Yeah. 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 Table six. Maria. Seven. Go Seven. Seven. Got it. I like you too. Okay. I love the, the learning group love. All right. Group four. Sorry, just had to throw that out there. <laughs> uh, Maria Goyanis. Associate Producer, Public Theater. Yeah. Woo! And Paul Nicholson, 
Oh, Paul. Executive Director, OSF. I'm on? I'm on. Hello, everybody. Thank you. It's uh, really lovely to be here to see old friends, James, Marshall, Chu, Benny. I mean, lots of people in the room whom I know, Lori, and also to uh, meet newer friends like Kwame and, and others that I look forward to meeting in the future. Um, I said to Kwame, just we just huddled for a couple of minutes, and I said, I don't know what your name means, but I was thinking it should mean you came at the right time. <laughs> and then you said... I've heard that said before. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist it. It was just like, this kind of tells you where my humor is at at this hour on a Sunday morning. Uh, I think I'm blushing. <laughs> um, it, 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 it means uh, born to find the way. How fabulous, right? Um, I know that uh, I wasn't able to be with you yesterday, I'm sorry, uh, but I know that you went through issues of demographics, you went through issues of why, you went through a lot of things so, so that I don't sort of have you completely glaze over to go over all the same uh, information again. Um, I do want to just make a couple of remarks and one is that I think again that where we are is very, was very much mirrored in the election in terms of who do we want to be, which was, is right back there on the uh, board. And it's who are we and who do we want to be, who do we want to become as a nation, as an art form, and as a theater community. And I think that, this, that these issues of diversity and inclusion are absolutely critical to those questions. Um, <clears throat> To me, I know that you've had definitions of diversity and you've been defining it for yourself. I just want to say that for me, for a long time, diversity refers to difference and a respect for that difference and our respecting everyone at the table. And uh, inclusion means that there's room for everyone at the table, in my view. Um, and I also think that diversity is our reality now. If you look around us, if you look at our neighborhoods, if you walk down our streets, in whatever form that means, however you do define it, and that inclusion is our future. So it's not that diversity is something that's over there and it's off and remote. It's, we're, it's, it's here now. It's been here for quite a long time. So I just want to acknowledge that. And to say that continuing change has to come not only from the groundswell of the, of the expression of artists, but it's really critical that it also come from the top, from youth, who are the board of trustees and who are the leadership of the theater institutions that really uh, will determine the future of theater in our country. And that as you undergo these efforts, that something that's, I think, also really critical, which I think our panel will testify to, uh, is that transparency in your efforts are really very important as well. And that we'll talk about this later, but this kind of sharing of information uh, is very important. And I think that the resource page I looked at in the book is very good. I just mentioned to the panel, I think the only thing I didn't see on there is sort of the issue of how you communicate that message to the public and to artists, to, your, to the profession, to your peers, and the, and the issue of accessibility. Now accessibility means a lot of things, and it doesn't just relate to disability, although it certainly does relate to disability, but it's also accessibility of programming, accessibility of information, accessibility of, um, of the way that the theater is responsive to the, the community. And again, however you define diversity within your geographical, socioeconomic, political circumstances. Um, what I want to ask our, our panelists, just to start, is for them, since I, there seems to be, I think it starts with an idea and a commitment to 
go forward with these issues of diversity and inclusion. And I'd like to ask each of them just to begin, and then we'll get into their very specific models. But what for each of you was the tipping point? What was your point of entry into these issues? Paul? Oh, okay. Well, hi, everybody. Glad to have the chance to be here with you. Um, you know, I think the, the tip, the, the, I wouldn't say the tipping point, but the point where um, I realized that, that uh, the issue of diversity was a really important one for us to grapple with as an organization um, started uh, when we were doing a production of The Tempest. And, uh, Which was, was when? Like, hmm? When was this? Uh, this was in 92, 1992. 20 years ago. And, uh, the, the, the concept for uh, the, the Caliban was that he was to be in chains. And the director, who was uh, an elderly white man, um, had, a, I think, a, a terrific vision for the show. But this was, this was fairly central to him, that the Caliban be in chains. Caliban was black. And there was no attention paid by us as an organization to the issue of what this meant as far as slavery was concerned. And we started to hear from the company, from the actors within the company, you're not paying any attention here to this issue. And we realized we've got to do something about it. And that's really when we started to think about what do we need to put in place, what sort of structures, what sort of um, programming we needed to put in place to su support the work, because we realized that this is going to be with us for a long, long time. Good. Maria, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, I was just writing some notes. The, I'm so glad to be here, by the way. You guys are awesome. Um, you know, so I started working at the public. I was one of George Wolfe's last hires. So I literally was like, he was resigning, and he was like, I'm getting you in before I go. And I was like, <laughs> awesome. And I, had, I felt lucky because I got to stay, um, because I had worked for Oscar Eustace at Trinity Rep. Um, I am uh, Latina. Um, I'm Spanish and Dominican. And one of the things that uh, George always said from the get-go, you know, obviously there's a huge history of uh, this idea of radical access at the public theater at the New York Shakespeare Festival. It's at the core of the mission, right? Free Shakespeare to everyone in New York City, regardless of class and race, etc. you know? And so, and then in terms of the new plays, that's been the history as well. And George followed that, and Oscar's been uh, uh, following that as much as possible. So for me personally, you know, the transition, the moment that I was, that it sort of hit me in the face was that moment of transition from George to Oscar, right? Because suddenly you have a very, you know, an, George, a very outspoken leader, particularly on this topic, and Oscar definitely needing to uh, carry the mantle forth of the idea of the public being a kind of, you know, that famous phrase, the subway car of New York City, you know, should be in the lobby of the public. And I think, you know, my hope is that with the renovation of the public spaces at the building and sort of this idea of thinking about access in a new way, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, we're continuing to do that. But for me personally, it was like, oh shit, we gotta keep this going. <laughs> because, you know, here you have an, an emblem of that with George Wolfe, and then suddenly Oscar comes, and I love the guy, but he's, you know, you know he's from Minnesota, for God's sakes. It's like, you know, he's not that there's anything bad from Minnesota. <laughs> but you don't necessarily look at him and go, you don't necessarily look at him and go, okay, he's the model of diversity in the, in the American theater, right? And so who are the people around him, myself and the producing team and other people who are influencing not only programming, but also thinking about these issues and reminding that there needs to be heat around these issues, right? Because aren't, those aren't necessarily the issues at the forefront of his mind and his, and his uh, uh, vision, you know what I mean? And I think that we're trying to do that as much as possible. I love Thank Minnesota. I, love Minnesota. <laughs> I feel like I just love New York. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Well, first of all, can I just say how overjoyed I am to be on a panel with both of you and both of your institutions. Both of you are, are role models to me. Your institutions, are, and as you know, I'm working with both of yeah. you, and it's it's. It's such a joy to come into both of your institutions and know that, that what you're about to say and what you're saying is not rhetoric but reality. 
and it's, 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 it's wonderful. Um, for my institution, and speaking for me, uh, evidently, um, inclusion and diversity, of, of course, has <laughs> been from the get-go, personally. So rather, I don't have to channel it very, very far. Um, but in terms of my institution, I have to say I am a tremendously fortunate man, and it was part of the reason why I took the job with Centre Stage, is that I inherited an institution that had this right at the center of their mission. Inclusion, diversity, a board not afraid of diversity, um, evidently. Um, before me, had employed a female artistic director 20 odd years ago. The managing director before uh, current Wonderful One was Asian. Um, I, so right from the top, the board were just like the best person for the job is the best person for the job. And even more than that, that we will make sure that we represent our community. And, and that was tremendous. And then, of course, it went to Irene and the board again in terms of realizing that they were in Baltimore, 65% of the population being African American, and making sure that the programming of our theater made sure that it reached out to that community and said, we know where we are. We know that you count. Right. We want you to feel not only wanted in this theatre, but that it's part of your DNA. Right. And so dedicated a third of the season to African-American voices and diasporic voices. That's how I first arrived at the theatre. What's brilliant is that that can sound like an act of benevolence. Come in to the Grand House and, and we'll let you in. But actually, historically, um, maybe seven of our top ten grossing shows have been from our African-American audience, primarily. So not only was there a need to do it yes. in terms of cultural and, and moral need, there then was an economic need to continue it. Because not only did the community say thank you, but we will repay you by making sure that we come. And we, and we support you. So I'm a wonderfully lucky person that I've inherited an organization that actually cares about this way beyond rhetoric, that it is part of its DNA. Right. And my job, and of course we'll talk about this later, is to perpetuate it into the 21st century, to give it a 21st century smile to that welcome. Excellent. Thank you. That, great introduction. Um, I'd like to start with Paul to ask you about the protocols that you have instituted with the phenomenal, not only for 20 years, but also more recently with the phenomenal Carmen Morgan uh, at OSF. If you'd like to speak to that. And, and I've said to Paul, I think your middle name is intentional and proactive uh, in terms of the work that they've done at OSF. Would you like to kind of sure, speak to that? I'd be really happy to, to address some of the things that we, we have done. Of course, uh, um, as I indicated before, when we we go back about 20 years in terms of thinking about this, and it was really um, in, in about 96 or 97 when we started really kicking it off with the, uh, bringing in our first uh, diversity consultant. And we, we, since that time, we, we've had a diversity consultant all the way through. And, and I think this is a really important point because um, we, we recognize that we could not do it alone. We needed to have resources, and that's something that I would encourage you to have a look at as, as, as you go forward in, 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 on this journey. Um, specifically, some of the things that uh, we have done, of course, the, uh, um, you know, we're, we're theatres, and we do theatre. And if our theatres don't reflect on stage what our um, philosophical bent is, then we're, we're not going to be going anywhere. So I, I, that's the first point that I, I do want to say, that, uh, it's, that the, the, the programming in terms of the, the, uh, the shows that we put in on and the way we do the work and who we do it with is pivotal in this whole thing. We're in a situation now where we are, some of you uh, I, I know have visited us, we're a, a pretty small white town in southern Oregon. Um, we have approximately 45% of our actors are actors of color. 46% um, of um, the shows we have done in the last uh, five years uh, have been uh, directed by women. 
uh, the, the, the whole issue of diversity is so important to us. We have a deaf actor uh, who does extraordinary work on stage, but be because of that requires um, real innovation in terms of the way uh, he's supported in, uh, as far as uh, sign interpretation is concerned at design conferences or rehearsals or whatever, but also uh, interpretation for the, for the audience. And, and really innovative ways of looking at how signing can be integrated in, into the various shows. I think the thing that really, if I reflect back on it, the thing that really um, made the difference for our organization where it was a realization about five years ago, a little before Carmen joined us and, and sort of helped shape some of the way we went about it, we realized that we did not have a structure to support the work that we do. And uh, through a whole series of conversations and explorations and trials and, frankly, tribulations, we got, uh, we, we created a structure. And really, it's, it's rather simple. Uh, it, it didn't seem simple at the time. But, uh, and, and there's a, the, the, the information on that is in your handout, uh, in the handouts that you've got in the book. But it, it's a structure, it's a th basically a three-legged stool that we have, that we have a platform, uh, if you like, at the, at, at the top that every, every, everything can sit on, um, and that's what we call the Diversity and Inclusion Planning C Council, or DIPSI, and, um, <laughs> because we like a little whimsy in the, in, in the work we do. Um, and that is supported by three legs, one leg to do with the company, one leg to do with the work on stage, and one leg to do with the audience. And we've created what we call action committees that support each of the work uh, in those. And those action committees meet on a regular basis. And it's overseen, the work is overseen by the, this DIPSI, this council, that can relate to all of them and make sure that we're all moving forward in the, in the right direction. So that's really a, a, a crucial element, I would say. Uh, Great. Well, we'll continue. We have much more to say. Maria, would you like to speak to... Uh, yeah, sure. In terms of uh, different things happening at the public and stuff. Um, well, what your first of all, I would love you to start with. You've been there eight years. Yeah. To start with, <laughs> but and first as an artistic associate, then as director of uh, special projects, uh, also involved with the public lab, and then now with a as associate producer with a producing department. Yeah. Well, so one of the things that I felt really strongly about. So some, I got really lucky, right? So up until now, the associate producer has been sort of the lone ranger at the public, just doing all of the shows, working on all of them. It's, it's an illustrious, I feel it, it's big shoes to fill because from Bernie Gerson to Jenny Gerson to um, uh, uh, many others who have gone through there. Um, but one of the things, as the structure of the public changes and the idea of uh, quantity being just as important as quality, meaning that at the public theater you should be able to see many different types of work all of the time, that, that it's not just about the juxtaposition of the artists in the lobby meeting each other, but also the audiences in the lobby meeting each other, and which is actually a cornerstone of this renovation. Um, I was able to uh, increase my department to create a producing department. And one of the things that um, was really important to me is like who is who are the faces of this producing department who are going out, going around, and actually, um, you know, uh, uh, being the liaison for the artistic team and liaisoning with those artists and helping them through and nurture, um, nurture their work. Um, I'm proud to say that we have, you know, a Mexican American on the producing department. We have um, a biracial; she's Southeast Asian, Merope, um, on the producing department. I'm I'm working on it, right? And so, in my in my world, uh, I feel really happy that the public is moving in this direction. That in that it's about um, the face that we also bring to the artists. You know, I think that's a really important thing. Um, it's been a core of the hiring policies at the public for a very long time too to um, think about that kind of, um, who's at the table, simply put. Who is at the table? Um, and actually, Joe's Pub has been one of those. Uh, I keep thinking about them because they are such a small, they're a small entity, right? They program Joe's Pub outside of the public theater. The LLC is the restaurant and the bar and all this kind of stuff. That's a separate entity. But the programming and the marketing and all that stuff is just literally, it's eight people. And they do 800 shows a year. 
in that space. And that, and, and it's, it's insane, the kind of teamwork that they have to pull. <laughs> They're there all the time, and the shows are amazing. But one of the things that I really think is that they do, not just in the diversity of programming that they do, they do world music, you know, shows like readings, musicals, etc., solo acts, folk music, etc. But in the staff, it's actually made up in that in, with a uh, complete eye towards who, what is the constituency that they actually are trying to reach. Um, and it's eight people from all different backgrounds, from all over the United States and all over New York City. Um, and I think about them a lot in terms of when I was thinking about the producing department, you know, and that kind of teamwork that we needed to build. Good. Thank you. Kwame? Can I, can I just jump back to a little thing that Paul said? Yeah. I mean, I, I, and, and again, this is not about blowing smoke. I, I arrived here, as you know, 18 months ago, and one, one arrives in, in a post, you know, you have all your grand theories in you. You go, yeah, we're going to do this, 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 and then you land and you go, oh, okay. Um, you know, that which was going to take 10 seconds in your mind, you realize is going to take five years. Um, and, uh, but I landed at OSF for the very first time, and I was taken aback by the manifestation of my dreams, of that which I have articulated, mm. which was absolute reality, and which was that you can lead from both the organizational side and from the artistic side, and that you send those twin messages, one out to the organization and to the field, that we take this thing seriously, and another thing out to your audience, which is, this is just who we are, and join the party. And when I landed and I saw a Spanish Romeo and Juliet and party people talking about the Black Power movement and then all the way with LB and LBJ and what else did you have that was going on and the Merry Wives of Windsor which is looking at gay marriage and, and I just went oh my god this is subversively brilliant and in the, in that these people are flying in from all over to see this and, and, and the kind of audience that sometimes one can be suddenly, well, will they, are they hip? Are they really with it? And actually I've sat with audiences who I thought was just, you know, a kind of middle, what I'd call middle England, middle England, and they were sitting through this quiet subversion, taking it in and coming out of the other side, enjoying it because the art was done so well. So I just want to say, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, I don't wish it to blow smoke, but it really is, we can do this thing without fl waving a big flag saying, by the way, let's bring diversity in and quality therefore will be reduced. Yeah, it is, it's, a, it's a false dichotomy. Here, here. Yeah, and, uh, right. and I just want to say that. Um, so speak thank to you, you. now. Um, speak you want a job in our PR? <laughs> yeah, 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 I think that's what I was trying to do then. No, no. Um, <laughs> A bit like when Marshall got the big up for yesterday from the stage. He paid for it. Um, 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 I, again, and forgive me, I, I'm terribly fortunate in that I have a managing director partner who is more, even more interested and passionate about diversity than I am in Stephen Richard, which is wonderful because it means I don't have to play that card for obvious reasons. And, um, and so in our organization, one of the things that I'm, that I'm very interested in is looking at the model that was set up before I got there, and as I think as I hinted before, is, and looking as to how I can make it work for the 21st century. I think one of the things that I'm interested in in terms of diversity is of course the amount of work that is done by female playwrights and female artists on our stages. I find that in my core and in my DNA um, rather disgusting that 70% of our audiences are female and are led by women and that's not reflected in the kind of work that we're doing. So when, we, when I joined, we said that we would do 50% work every season of, by female playwrights. Um, and we will get there, and some years we will not, and some years we will, but that is the absolute intention. And I went out to our subscriber base and sold that I thought that this was important. Now the key is to make sure that the art that I choose, and um, make sure that, that I hit that out of the park, and make sure that that sells so that it feels just natural. Um, one of the other things, again, I inherited 13% of my uh, membership were African American and 20% roughly of our single ticket audience was African American. Mm. Um, I think what, what, but they're of a certain age. And so one of the big challenges I think that, that lies before for Stephen and I is how we make sure that the 45s 
for the 35s to 55s also feel now that they can come to the theatre and it's theirs because we don't have the August Wilson ticket that Irene had, the perfect storm of August coming in, being magnificent and brilliant, also being accepted by the white community and ending up on Broadway, so it automatically had all of that publicity and things attached to it. I now have to find that in Lydia and in Corey and in, in Katori. I have to be able to find the writers and hope that their slates are not filled for the next 10 years and get their plays onto our stage and say, come new generation of African American and people of color, come to our theater and know that it is not only for the older generation of African American, but it is also for you. Yes. And that's one of the major challenges that, that we're going to have over the next, or that I, in particular, that I'm going to have over the next five years. And also selling to our patrons, and I think we've done this fairly well at the moment, and we'll see, um, by saying that, that we just will be inclusive. It's not even something that is up for debate. We just did it. And I would finally say, I opened up my first season with um, a, a kind of multicultural um, enemy of the people, where I just cast whoever I felt, I felt was the best actor for it. And it was really interesting at the beginning of, and, it, and the way that it ended up was that the lead character, Dr. Stockman, was played by an African American actor. And, um, and at first, we got, I got a, little, a lot of pushback. From, hmm. from members of the audience in previews saying, I didn't think that I couldn't get into the play because an African American was playing the lead. Um, I didn't know if I was in Norway or not. And, 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 and I was really pleased that we could have that debate. Interestingly, by the time the show got two weeks in, and actually, and all of the acting had got to a level where where the audience could just buy into it straight away. Those kind of criticisms and those kind of observations um, declined. And, they, and the lesson that I learned from that is that, that, that if I'm going to do something like that, I've got to make sure that the art is out of sight, that the art is unquestionable. Right. And once we lead with the art being unquestionable, but yet know that diversity and inclusion is just something that we do, I think that our audiences, our institutions, will just follow suit. We are in the 21st century, and I left a country to come to a country that had a black president. And I'm pleased to say, he's back in. Yeah. Yes, yes. I really didn't want to move to Canada. Yeah, right. Wait, I want to say something, actually. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, just to take something off of what you're saying. I'm still so surprised at how many times our casting department has to have the diversity discussion with the artists. I mean, it's crazy. Specifically, you mean directors and writers? Yes. Right. Specifically to say, oh, who, you know, that, that you know, you can't cast the, him as the daughter. Uh, him as the daughter. Yeah, right. That's him. That's, That's, That's true. Let's go with it. <laughs> him as the son, you know, he can't have a black son with a white uh, uh, mother and this and that or whatever. And I can't, I can't tell you, I literally think Jordan and Heidi, who are casting people, are going insane. They've been having the same conversation for 20 years for every single show that comes through the, I mean, you know, not every single show, but basically it's, it's frequent and it happens so much. And it's like, I, I don't know how we can, I mean, I... Can I tell you how I think, wh wh why I think my audience at the moment, and you know, the journey is just at the beginning, and so one will discover later whether it's true or not. But one of the arguments that I used, or discussion points that I used, was to say that I think that theatre is the last place that should be literal. And we cannot be literal, or I cannot be literal, otherwise Americans should not do Shakespeare because it's mine and not yours. Yeah, right that we should not do Ibsen in England because it's Scandinavian and not British. And if you take that argument right to its end, what can we do? And so if theatre cannot be the place where I can leave literalism at the door and enter into the magic, then where am I? And it was very interesting that, that in presenting that, that discussion point, that many of our already said, okay, it makes sense. And in, just make sure the yeah, show works for me. It was either John Guerra or Jules Pfeiffer who 22 years ago said, it's a play, it's not a documentary. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> um, and it's where the imagination and creativity work 
creativity lives and works. Um, I wanted to say just a couple of things and then I want you to talk more about your models. Uh, but it seems to me that A, what you're talking about is that each of you has demonstrated a real commitment. Uh, B, we know that it takes time and that that you're able to accomplish certain things over a period of time, but not everything all at once. That you have also created benchmarks as you've gone along, and that as you've done that and met those, you then be able to create more benchmarks. But I know, uh, Paul, when we were speaking, you were also talking about the uh, not only the tools that you've created, but also the philosophical underpinnings, and in this also the importance of allies, if you want to, if you'd speak to that. And I also, before we finish this, so I need your help on this, Chris, the timekeeper, that I also want to ask each of you, which you've gotten into a little bit about the challenges that you've met along the way as well. Well, I think the, um if I, if I look at the models of the, in, in the organization and what, what we've been able to accomplish, part, one of the, the strongest things that we, we recognize is, uh, and we sort of, in a, in a way, sort of stumbled into this, um, uh, Freda Casillas, who was our audience development uh, manager, came to see Bill and me, Bill Rauch, our artistic director, and me one day and said, um, you guys are not on the same page as far as audience development is concerned. Um, Bill, for those of you who know him, is uh, very much uh, a, a, um, an idealist, and uh, I'm very, very much, uh, I'm very practical. And we, we, would, we would have the conversations and we would be going past each other. Fredo says, I cannot do my work if you're not on the same page. As a result, and I think that, that was, an, I thought, a really courageous thing to go to the leadership of the organization and say, you, you've got to get on the same page. The, a couple of things came out of that. One was this realization that as leaders of our organization, Unless we take a position on something, it's not going to go forward. Correct. I'm putting it another way. We've got to take a, the position. We've got to show leadership on, on these issues in order for it to move forward. Here, here. The, the second is that um, we, out of this, this, this discussion, we created what we call an audience development manifesto. And uh, that's also in the resource material that you, you've got. One of, the, one of my mantras... Uh, actually comes from a past board president that we had many, many years ago. And he said, remember, before anything can get done, some poor fool has to put something down on paper. <laughs> that's great. And that's sort of a really important thing. It sounds a little blip in a way, but it's really important because what happens when you put something down on paper, as this manifesto is, is you start to crystallize your thinking and you can start to bring divergent thinking together. So in the, in the process that we went through, we had five of us, Bill, his, his associate artistic director, um, Christopher Recibo, my di director of um, audience develop, uh, sorry, director of marketing and communication, and Freda, who's sitting over here as is, in, in terms of audience development. And we spent a year working on this document. It was not a frivolous thing. And this is another key point. It takes time to develop the, these sorts of things. But I can tell you that the creation of that, that, um, that credo and the way we sort of rolled it out to the company, the way uh, it, 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 it created a sense of connection between the five of us and then going out to the company as a whole has been pivotal in the way we've, we've, we've moved forward. So I think that's a, a really important, some, some important lessons right. to learn from there. I think the other thing that I want to mention is the whole issue of training. We've done, um, through Carmen, a great deal of training with the managers, <coughs> excuse me, with many members of the company, um, with the board, and so we're all starting to sort of get, get a sense of some sort of commonality. Sounds like more cohesion and than cohesion, sort of a right. coalescing. However, I do also want to say that we still get pushback, even though we've been doing And where does it come from? Well, it, 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 it's both internal pushback and external pushback. We get pushback externally, people, the sort of comments that you were making, about, about um, 
the, the, the certain uh, casting choices that we, that we might make. It's, and you know, it, it slowly ebbs over time that, that, that people start to realize, well, okay, you know, we had a three sisters with, with, with a, 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 one, one sister black, one sister white, and one sister Hispanic. And it started sort of the way you talked about with, with, with people um, saying, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And eventually they started to understand that the three sisters actually didn't represent in a literal way the three sisters, but all sisters. And that was a pretty big moment, Great. I think, for, for our audience. Um, internally, we still get pushback. The people, uh, you know, I, I hate to say it, but this is, this is a tough journey we're on. And um, we still have people who say, well, why are we doing this? And um, you know, I, I, I'm not buying into this, this, this whole thing. I don't understand why, you do, why you're doing that. Um, there's sometimes we do get resistance um, among some of the managers and uh, against some of the staff. I had a situation recently. Another thing that we've done very recently is created um, a whole new recruitment policy with a very strong written policy with a very strong focus on uh, the issue of diversity and in inclusion. And we rolled that out to all of our managers recently, and I heard back through the grapevine that uh, somebody uh, in the costume shop said, hmm, so as a 50-year-old white woman, I guess I ne would never get hired by the Oregon Shakespeare Festival again. I thought, oh, shit. Yeah, that's not the message. But it just shows you that this is, this is tough work. It's hard, and, and, but it, it, it's, it's so important. Wonderful. Totally. You know, one of the things I wanted to talk about here was um, a new uh, uh, program of sorts, a new initiative. Something's out. Oh, I can keep going. Um, a new initiative of sorts that's, that's coming up uh, at the public. Um, specifically, we're doing a, um, it's a project that right now is titled Public Works. And it is uh, connecting. Um, we right now have five community partners, uh, the Children's Aid Society, the Fortune Society. The Fortune Society is a group that does an alternative to incarceration program where people coming out of Rikers go to the Fortune Society and get jobs. Rikers, placement. not Rutgers. Rikers, Rikers Island. <laughs> Island. A different kind of prison. <laughs> Um, uh, a, a union, the Domestic Workers United Union. Um, basically, what we're talking about and thinking about is this idea of access, right? And this idea of um, transgressing the boundaries of audience in the theater. Because one of the things that we keep thinking is, you know, Shakespeare in the Park is awesome and great, and people go stand online, but now there's not a lot of people who can actually can stand in line. <laughs> you know, the line is pretty long, it gets to be a hard ticket sometimes. People don't come from the outer boroughs. So, you know, this is part of a bigger Uber idea. Um, um, that actually was piloted with the mobile unit. Um, you know, Joe Papp had a mobile unit when he first started uh, the New York Shakespeare Festival, and we've revived it um, to bring Shakespeare to prisons and to homeless shelters and to community centers. Um, we've done two productions, and one of the most um, moving, and one of the, it's actually a huge cornerstone for me of why I keep staying, you know, in the theater, because it's, it's a hard thing to think about your life in the theater, right? It's a hard thing to think that you can actually have sustainability and, and a family and those things in the theater. I'm not that old, you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm trying to sort of see the future, and I looked, I went to, um, it was a medium security prison in Chelsea, and uh, we were, I was watching Measure for Measure, and I have never seen women, it was a woman's uh, prison, I have never, they talked back to the audience, they were so in it, they understood every moment, it was literally, I mean, it blew my mind, um, and it made me realize that that was actually, you know, that this ab absolutely was for the public theater, um, the 21st century of how we, how we needed to approach the work. Um, and so with those five community partners, um, we're doing acting classes, we're doing you know, dance classes with the Senior Citizen Center in Brownsville, you know? and the idea is hopefully, um, knock on wood, we'll be able to do a kind of community pageant at the Delacorte with, the, to, with uh, uh, cameos from other New York City groups um, and actually create art 
of high, the highest artistic quality, you know, um, with these community members, really have help them see that theater has a place for them in their life too, um, which is which was the whole idea um, with Joe Papp and Shakespeare. It was literally he was like Shakespeare changed my life, you know, as a young boy and growing up in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and it can it should change yours too if you have access to it. Um, so it's it's a huge. Uh, it's a huge undertaking, knock on wood, that we'll be able to um, make it happen. It's wonderful. And it speaks to a uh, community, and it speaks to um, being available. It speaks to relevancy. It speaks to accessibility. Uh, can you comment on what you're doing? Uh, if I may, just before Please. that. But again, uh, not to blow smoke again, but your initiative, <laughs> your, your initiative, I, I, you know, I, I, your initiative with Classical Theatre of Harlem, yeah. um, in terms of a play that starts with Detroit 67, which starts at the public, and then goes up into Harlem to say that this is not, we're not just saying for you to come up to us, but we will bring the art that we produce to you right. and make you, audience, feel inclusive. So it's our home, and I think that's a wonderful initiative. Well, so this season what we're doing is an uptown-downtown partnership with Classical Theatre of Harlem, National Black Theatre, and the public with this play by a major new American artist, Detroit 67, by Dominique Morisot and Kwame. It's actually like, I know, amazing, right? She's the best. Um, and Kwame is actually directing it. And uh, that, that uh, uh, collaboration is going to start downtown, and we're going to run it for three weeks, and then we're going to take it and bring it uptown and into Harlem for three weeks. And, and it'll be at the National Black Theater, who, interestingly enough, Barbara Ann Tier, who's, who founded the National Black Theater, actually directed one of the first mobile unit tours for Joe Papp in 1965 with Gwendolyn Brooks' We Real Cool, um, all through the boroughs of New York City. So talk about the history and the foundation that we're there, that we're sort of spinning off on. So, Good. Yeah. Kwame. Sorry to be your PR agent as well. You can. That's great. Uh, can I just jump around very quickly with two or three different points? I, I, one of the most important things to me, particularly at this, um, at this forum, is, is making sure that, that the governors and the trustees understand that it begins with them. Um, Stephen and I are amid a, a strategic plan for the next five to however long uh, it is. And um, when we were sitting down just talking through our points, and the head of that board, a wonderful man called Ed, said, um, where's diversity here? And we said, well, if we're doing it. It's, it's just him. And he said, that, if you don't say it, if you don't articulate it every single time, it means that it's no longer a priority for the organization. And it might just slip. Right. And Stephen and I went, and Stephen actually said that as well. And it meant that we must articulate it at every time. And it's got to come right from the top. So that actually, as we go lower down in the organization, that everybody feels supported. Um, when I arrived, it was very important for me that, um, and, and talking to pushback and resistance, because of course there's resistance, and one has to negotiate that resistance with sensitivity and understanding that we're all human beings and we all want to, to hold on to the piece of earth that we have, whether we've inherited it through privilege or not. Um, and one of the interesting things was, I, what Steve and I sat down and said, so, of course, I'm an artist director and I'm of color, but it, if I look around the rest of our senior management at our theater, um, I, I don't see any, any other color. I am people of color. And um, so let's have a talk about diversity. You know the board supports it. You know that we support it. And of course, then one gets into some of the beautifully framed questions that we were debating yesterday, which is the kind of contradiction of, well, if we start going down the road of diversity, do you want us as department heads to look for maybe underqualified people. And one, again, has to negotiate that, I think, with a sense of leadership, which is simply that, particularly for us, in a city of 65% African Americans, even though that's the majority of our patrons come from our suburbs as well, but that we must be seen and must make sure that we are representative. One of the things that, and, and negotiating with that pushback, I think, as I've said, mm -hmm. needs leadership and needs it to be written down, that we have to write it down and say, right. this we will do. I think the other thing is, is what am I doing? 
as a person of color. And I realize, again, the great privilege that I have as a person of, of color leading a national institution like Center Stage. And know that there just aren't that many other black men doing that, need I say black women. And so I made sure, and we made sure, that, uh, that I had an artistic directing intern um, straight away, we'd never had that before in the building, that will always be someone of color to make sure that I am making, that, that the baton is being passed on and that that information is being given to, and also that that person will be local, that they must come from Baltimore or Maryland. But so that's part of the leadership. That's part of the leadership in making sure. <laughs> now there's pushback on that. Of course there is. You know, there, in fact, there's other interns who say, oh, I hear I couldn't apply for that post because I'm not of color. And so, and which means that that intern then has to deal with that kind of, but actually my advice and, and, and in, in conversation with the other is saying that I must do this because if I do not, it is not feeding the infrastructure of the community that I have been brought in to serve. Right. And that is both Maryland, Baltimore and the field and that, that one must do that. Stephen has done a similar thing with his intern in making sure that, that a management intern is of color. And so we're sending out, that's the five minute, I'll stop, but um, sending out signals to the organization and to the field that we take this seriously, that we're not just looking at it from an intern level as well, but there even is a department head. And this is where I think I, my, my heart just says thank you. There's a department head who came to see me privately and said, I know we all agree with diversity. I know we all think that we should have someone of color at the upper echelons. And therefore, I will probably transition out. And I know someone of color who I think would be wonderful for this role. Wow. Um, not just oh, well, talking, but walking minute. the walk. And that was a wonderful example of, of someone who is Caucasian American not just articulating it, not just making it rhetoric, but actually trying to make it into reality. It is all of our roles. Fantastic. I think that we're close to having Q&A here. Um, I just wanted to say it seems to me that of just a few things that have been expressed is the importance of leadership, that, that all of you are involved in this, that it has to come from the top down. You're the gatekeepers. You're the ones who establish the policy. You're the ones who create the, current, the North Star to which you have to keep returning to find out where you are in that journey. Um, that no matter how much any of us has done, there's still so much more to do. That uh, artistic excellence is the most important of all of this. Uh, and so that diversity and inclusion never mean a compromise of artistic excellence. The given is artistic excellence uh, to begin with. I think that what is important as we all go forward, that there are a lot of you in the room who are doing a lot of work. Some of you who may be uh, a little newer to the, the continuum, but that what's really going to be important is that we all share our resources with one another so that as we go forward, we establish best practices and so that no matter, and in going forward, that no matter where you are on that arc, that you get, you have the reassurance that you can do something. Whether you're a small theater, whether you have a lot of money, whether you have no money, whether you have geographical limitation, whatever it may be, that eventually what you begin to develop is best practices that will be helpful to everyone. And the only way we can do that is by sharing and having that reflective learning that we all have with one another in this room and I think this has been an amazing experience here and I the final thing I just want to say is that it's clear that no matter where you are in that continuum in that arc in that spectrum is that there's a role for each of us and all of you to play um, I think that our panelists have been extraordinary today and I really look forward to your all receiving the uh, whatever comes out of this, the notes from what they've offered here today because I think they're absolutely remarkable. So I want to thank them for this. I want to open it up to Q and A. And I, before I, I saw Ralph, Ralph is it right? Yes. Yeah, I saw Ralph's hand up even before, like five minutes oh. before the Q and A. <laughs> so uh, let's go to Ralph first. <laughs> hey guys, hello everybody, great panel. 
Uh, and uh, thanks for all the work that you all do. Um, I love each and every one of you for what you've done and what you're continuing to do. Um, I'm Ralph Remington, Director of Theater, Musical Theater, the National Endowment for the Arts. And um, uh, Rocco and I have had, uh, Rocco Land has been the chair of the NEA, and I have had some intense conversations, uh, which, you know, we are highly supportive of uh, diversity and senior leadership and greater, having greater diversity and senior leadership in these organizations. So with that in mind, what a lot, you know, we get a lot of complaints and a lot of issues, and when we, people come in for panels, they, they bring up uh, a lot of things. And, so over the last four or five panels, um, several different panelists, not just uh, people of color, but uh, white folks as well, have said that they believe that some theaters may be practicing exclusionary hiring practices uh, in violation of Title Five, Six, and Seven of the Civil Rights Act. And uh, what they say, why they say this, is because there are so many anecdotal stories about, uh, you know, 12, 14 uh, people that are brought to the board of a lot of these theaters, there are frequently people of color in that mix, really qualified people of color, but the last two or three people that are brought to the board are almost always white people. And so in reaction to that, and Joseph Hodge, who has been a great ally in this issue, has advocated, among others, um, for an adoption of the Rooney Rule uh, in theater, whereas if, um, for those of you who don't know, it comes out of football, where after in NFL, what they did was they found that time after time head leadership positions were going to, head coaching positions were going to uh, white people, even though they were qualified people of color, until they decided as a group that we will at least interview one person of color in every final grouping, whether, you know, when you have your two or three people. So a fairly long question and statement, but just want to get your reactions to what, what are your feelings about that as a panel? about adopting the Rooney Rule uh, throughout uh, the American theater. Thanks. Paul, I actually saw that you had uh, spoken about that, right, with, uh, in yeah. an earlier email, so would I, I'll ask you to respond okay, to that. Okay, I can talk a little bit about it. I actually talked with the chief counsel for the Seahawks um, football team about how this actually works in practice. <laughs> and. Um, uh, and it, it was illuminating just what a difference it's made, that it's taken the number of black coaches from about 5% up to just on 30% um, today, and he, he uh, absolutely attributed the, the Rooney rule um, to, that, that, uh, to, to, to that result. Um, there are some downsides um, to it that, that um, apparently, um, it, 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 to some degree, um, because of the, the desire, and, I, I, and here's the lesson I, I would say for us, the de because of the desire can lead to people, not at the, co the head coach level, but at the, the, the next level down, not being as, as experienced as... Uh, as, as they would normally want. And so what we, if we're thinking about as a, as a field adopting something like this, we have to be very aware that, that part of the deal is giving a broader range of experience, a, a, a broader um, d diversity of, of, of um, prospective candidates, a lot of experience uh, in the field. So I think it's wor really worth exploring. I know the arguments against the pi about the pipeline and, and so on, but frankly, Come on. I totally agree with that. But that you. also speaks to, but it also speaks to uh, establishing achievable outcomes. Right. And uh, uh, yeah. And, and further, I talked about our recruitment policy that we adopted um, just recently, and an important element of that is a requirement to to have people of color in that candidate pool, that they've got to be there, and the expectation is that in the group that will be um, interviewed, there's at least one, one person of color. Does either of you want to respond to that? Because I know we have several I mean, other hell questions. yes. All I have to say is hell yes. I mean, and not only, not only that, not only because these uh, artists of color and leaders of color should be leading these institutions, but hell, come on, man. We all know that first interview sucks. You know what I mean? Exactly. And it's hard, right? And 
And so if you're not actually in the pool and moving through and actually getting as part of that, that group of people, then you don't actually learn what it, what it is that you need to be working on professionally. It's, called, it's about professional development, period. Yes. And if you don't have the opportunity for that kind of professional development to meet a board and finally have an interview with a board, it's a big deal. And that's scary. It could be scary the first time, you know? I could only say ditto. Ditto. All right. There were, I'm sorry, there, boy, the hands are going up. There were, uh, I want, there was a gentleman in back here, yes. Uh, Rock Schulter from the Goodman. Uh, and I was oh, really going to talk about audience development, but if people want to talk about the Rooney Rule, I'll defer my, or, or you know, pass on the, the baton to something else. Okay. Well, it was just a perspective uh, talking about, uh, and I guess talking to theaters in this room who are, are thinking about audience development and diversifying their audience. And, and uh, when we, back in 1978, proactively decided that the Goodman should be reflective of the community, uh, it, you know, we, we changed our programming. And I mean, it doesn't take long in this business to go from a young Turk to an old fart, and I've made that transition. <laughs> but back then, I actually was a young Turk, and we thought, we will diversify our programming, audiences will flock, we will be heroes in the community, it will be great. And of course, none of that happened. White audiences were alienated, uh, African American audiences and audiences of color didn't trust our commitment, uh, and it was a very rough process. However, um, over the court, you, you have to stick with it, which is stay, what Paul was saying. Course. And, and I right. guess I'm, I'm uh, uh, what I can say after 30 some years of making diversity a core value of our organization is that what started to happen, and Bob Falls played a big part of it because when he became artistic director, and somebody said this yesterday, you know, if you are a diverse organization, A, it starts with the programming, and if, you know, one of eight slots is a diverse slot, that's not a commitment to diversity. Uh, so 33 to 50% to um, started to make up our seasons, and over the course of time, not only audiences, but potential board members, <laughs> artists uh, began to gravitate to the Goodman so that, uh, and, and the point of all this is to say that it does take time, but what we now have is the largest audience that we've ever had, uh, the most diverse audience that we've ever had, and, uh, and not just in terms of individuals of color, but you know, there are, there are lots of other white people out there who are interested in things outside of their own narrow perspective. And so they're intrigued by the, the range of programming that we're doing as well. Um, so, you know, do it. Do it. It's, it. It is the world. It is the world that we live in. Forget 2042. It's the world we live in now. Uh, do it. Uh, you know, TCG's opportunity to, to, to share resources of people who've had experience in this area who can be helpful when, you know, audiences rebel. I got to say, though, you know, what's really ironic about all this is that the, the first play that we did with non-traditional casting or colorblind casting was An Enemy of the People <laughs> <laughs> with Paul Winfield and Bill Marshall. And, awesome. you know, it's sort of both depressing, you know, in general to hear that they're still asking the same damn questions. Yeah. You know, some white people are still asking the same damn questions 30 years later. It's also, it makes me proud to be, you know, like in, in Chicago and Illinois, the, the bluest of blue states, because those questions aren't asked anymore in our community. Colorblind casting is, is a fact of life. I mean, yeah, sure, are they asked once in a while? Do we still get people who say, you know, you, you've got a great theater, but we could, you could, like, do you have to do so much black stuff, you know? But hey, it's America. You're, you're, you're never going to not get pushback. Uh, the point is you're going to have a whole new uh, world open up to you that you could never have imagined. Great point. Um, I think you were next, yes? And then you, sir. I, I woke up this morning thinking about February 
And, <laughs> but, but wait, it's actually a very positive statement that I want to make and a question. Um, I have noticed that it's easy for us as artists to be in this um, interesting place of being often the, voice, the, the mouthpiece for what's not right and what isn't working and um, striving for what can always be better. Fifteen years ago, I wouldn't have had a career were it not for February. Amen. And um, <laughs> it's not about being a champion of only shows of color can happen in certain months, but about understanding from which we came and asking theaters to use us as mouthpieces for how to go forward so that we're put in the position more right. of being able to talk about the companies that are doing it the way it should be done so that we have the freedom to also create, uh, critique those companies that are doing it the way it should be done. Here, here. Um, but I think it also it has to do with rem remembering that uh, your artists are one of your greatest tools for being an advocate so that Resources. we don't have to have, we don't have to just have a contentious relationship. Um, so I say thank you for February. <laughs> and I, I also appreciate that it has been five years since a play of mine has been produced in February. So um, let's not, please don't, don't just go, oh no, okay, no, February, fine, we tried. Um, you know, produce us in February sometimes. And, but it's a short month, I will say. That's less money <laughs> for us. And yay to April and, you know, June. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Oh, oh this will be the last question, apparently. Um, We're getting the... And um, I was just recently, and, and actually uh, Teresa and Kevin were at the Grant Makers in the Arts meeting that just took place in Miami last month, and they were talking about this too. So um, having been in this discussion for about 25 years, uh, it really became out of um, style for a long time. So the fact that it's bubbling back up into the consciousness of bodies like this, I think really deserves um, you know, just owning that and, and celebrating that. Um, one of the questions that uh, we took on at the Grant Makers in the Arts meeting in a small group session was, what happens to people of color that are, that are hired in majority institutions and then actually get sort of shunned for being a person of color and bringing that perspective to the conversation when that was actually why they got hired, right? And so um, a couple of the things that you guys said this morning really um, captivated my attention, which was how do you build internal partnerships so that the people of color at your institution aren't always the ones that have to lead that charge? Right. And yeah. I think that, you know, uh, Kwame, you said it a couple of times, Paul, all of you said it, um, but as we start codifying and analyzing things that have worked in some of our spaces um, for the larger group, what are some of the strategies and tactics to building those internal coalitions to make this a fight that we're all taking on as a field versus, you know, the person of color who gets hired? Great point. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists today, Paul Nicholson, Maria, Maria uh, Goyanes, and Kwame Kwe Amar. Thank you so much. And thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much to our panel. You gonna sit up here for a minute? Okay, stay there. No, stay there. No, we're supposed um, to get our mics changed. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, turn the, the floor back over to Carmen Morgan in a minute because we're going to be doing some action planning now. Um, but
but before we do that, I just want to do two things. One is read you a couple more post-its from the Where We Want to Be board. Um, one says, at least half of Lord artistic directors and managing directors are people of color. Um, so that's for our, our where we want to be. And another said there will be at least one candidate of color and one female candidate interviewed for per positions of leadership in TCG theater. So that um, those both of those relate directly to some of what we were just discussing. Um, I also just thought you might be interested in knowing, because we've talked about TCG's strategic planning, um, and we had a great process with our board and staff that took place over the last year or so, um, and of the initiatives that we are really concentrating on, diversity and inclusion uh, is a, a really major focus in our strategic plan. So I'm going to tell you um, the six areas that were within the diversity initiative at TCG that we're focusing on. Um, we are also going to be adjusting a bit because while we're working with a, a brilliant task force, many of you are here who are serving on the task force, we're also really interested in what you need based on what you've discussed over these last few days. So input is welcomed. Um, here are the six things that we're really looking at. One is to do research um, to understand the current state of diversity in our field. Um, so really looking at a baseline so that as we go forward, we have something to, to measure against. Second is conducting a literature, a literature review of critical thinking about race, diversity, and inclusion. Um, the third is developing training programs and convenings on cult cultural awareness, managing diversity, and activating change. And obviously this weekend is um, an example of that. Expand the Young Leaders of Color program into a more robust year-round program. Um, yeah. 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 Create programming to support capacity building for culturally specific theaters and identifying strategies to increase opportunities for artists of color. Um, so again, that's our current thinking, and we, I have some ideas just based on what we've been discussing today about ways that we can um, really support trustees as well in their efforts to, to attack diversity within their organizations. Um, so all of this requires leadership from our field to work, and what I'd like to do at this point is ask Carmen um, to stand and lead us through the next part of our agenda. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Tracy. 